Manitoba was built on agriculture and the family farm. At the turn of the century, agriculture was the reason that the Manitoba Legislative Building is this huge, beautiful building because it was booming. We were going to be the Chicago of the North. Funding for Built on Agriculture is provided in part by Manitoba Government, Growing Forward Two, a federal, provincial, territorial initiative, Government of Canada, MacDon Industries, Monsanto, Canada, the Bicentenary of the Red River Selkirk Settlement Committee, and the members of Prairie Public. 200 years ago, Lord Selkirk had a dream of building an agricultural community on the cold prairies of Manitoba. Agriculture did become established and his dream was realized. But over those 200 years, this prairie region would witness massive changes in farming, business, the makeup of society, and the role of women. Various institutions, regulatory agencies, and exchanges would emerge along with a series of farmer-run organizations. Around the turn of the 20th century, there was just a huge measure of discontent with how the grain handling system and the marketing system was treating farmers. They felt that they were being wronged, not only on the driveway of the elevators that they were delivering to, but by the Winnipeg Grain Exchange, which was where, in farmers' eyes, the speculators were being used to drive down prices artificially. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, agriculture was becoming very significant in Western Canada. And the issue was that producers felt that they were bound by a couple of things. One was they couldn't get rail cars from the railway, and that forced them to go through the grain companies. They would have to deliver their grain to the grain companies. And they really felt that on both quality and quantity, they were not necessarily being treated fairly. Essentially what we had happen was the, the agrarian movement coalesced around the common enemy and they began to build a structure. They began to lobby very heavily with the government to get legislation in place. There was the Manitoba Grain Act, which was followed by the Canada Grain Act. And from there you had these farmer-owned grain companies start to build a system where they felt that they should take back grain handling and marketing from the speculators in Winnipeg. And one way to do that was by establishing cooperatives. And really it was a vehicle for farmers at the time to take control of their marketing by virtue of having their own people trading. There was a lot of suspicion that the markets were rigged, that there was speculation that was in, not in the interest of farmers. There were co-ops, the pool organizations in particular, in Western Canada that espoused more of a left of center controlled marketing environment. United Grain Growers on the other side tended to espouse and, and promote a laissez-faire, free enterprise environment for marketing grain. The pooling organizations were set up in the 1920s and they had a much more radical, if you like, pure and idealistic version of cooperatism. And they also wanted to get around the machinations of the grain exchange which they considered to be an evil gambling den. Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, the three largest food grain producing provinces, actually established their own cooperatives, Manitoba Pool, Saskatchewan Wheat Pool, and, and Alberta Wheat Pool, as a balance against the privately held companies at that time. It's like any competition, the way it would have provided leverage is by, by giving farmers an option. 
Certainly the cooperative members would likely deal with their own cooperatives to offer pricing and service alternatives to what they had up until that point or what they felt they had up until that point. They became larger than the privately held companies ultimately. It resulted in a lot of farmers who saw cooperation not as much of a political movement as just a pragmatic way of cooperating. Few individuals have had as significant an impact on prairie history as Edward Alexander Partridge. He was six foot tall with blue eyes that flashed when he talked and hands that were constantly in motion. He was a dreamer, an idea man. When he talked, people listened. He believed that farmers should and could have more control over their destiny if they united. I was a child of the Territorial Grain Growers Association, and more specifically a child of Ed Partridge, who was very much a moving spirit behind both the formation of the Territorial Grain Growers Association, and then subsequently a moving spirit behind the creation of the Grain Growers Grain Company. He and a small group in Sintaluta started the Territorial Association, but Partridge had bigger plans and a larger vision and he wanted to set up a cooperative grain handling and marketing company as well. In 1906, Partridge saw part of his dream come alive, but his continued butting of heads with the grain exchange led to the Grain Growers Grain Company losing trading privileges at the grain exchange. Largely a matter of belligerence on both the part of Ed Partridge, who hated the exchange, and on the part of the exchange, who wasn't that happy with him, Partridge was fond of calling the Winnipeg Grain Exchange a combine with gambling hell thrown in. The exchange also wanted Partridge out, no question. And so the company replaced uh, Partridge as the official member with another person in the, in the company. Ed Partridge did not disappear. He became editor of the company's monthly journal, The Grain Grower's Guide, often contributing fiery articles of his own. He authored the Partridge Plan that called for public ownership of grain elevators and advocated a nationwide overhaul of the grain business. Because Ed Partridge was, was a moving spirit behind the territorial grain growers and was a moving spirit behind the Grain Growers Grain Company. But his history after that is rather interesting because he stayed on the board of directors of the Grain Growers Grain Company until 1912. And then he had a falling out tragedy was part of Partridge's life. He lost a leg in a farming accident, one of his daughters drowned, his wife died of a heart attack, and he lost two sons in the First World War. When Partridge left, he tried to start up another grain company and it failed. And then he became an activist and then he wrote a book called Poverty and was active in some very left-wing organizations and then sort of just disappeared out to the West Coast, lived with his daughter, and then he just disappeared. So that happens with radicals. Farmer, teacher, businessman, agrarian radical, Ed Partridge died of asphyxiation in 1931 at the age of 69, alone in a boarding house in Victoria, British Columbia. His only income for a number of years was a monthly stipend of $75 from the United Grain Growers. The structure of the co-ops was always changing, and in the 21st century, they began to disappear. Co-ops needed money for capital expansion, and uh, as co-ops, being able to raise that money from members was becoming more and more difficult. They had invested so long ago and the facilities were so far written off, to actually build modern facilities was going to require a massive injection of capital. You know, throughout most of the 20th century, there's been a consolidation of, of cooperatives, of, of companies generally. In the 1990s, there was probably the last phase of it where the big co-ops amalgamated. At the time, they had become public companies even, so they really weren't member farmers and operated by member farmers. They'd become member-owned or, or completely publicly traded companies. To a certain extent, it was a bit of a surprise that they all disappeared just in terms of an approach. They just weren't generating enough profits in the first place to be able to reinvest in the capital required to build new facilities. 
And by 1990, all the co-ops were facing severe financial challenges. The pools were, and UGG was, and, and what do we do about this? It's ultimately the producer that decided in the end that the, uh, there wasn't a requirement for the sort of cooperative style of business. And today, all that's really remaining are private grain companies and no cooperatives. So the producer himself has changed his requirement, and I think that the grain business, the agri-grain business in Canada, has changed to meet that demand. Well, the Wheat Board came into being, I guess, largely because the four pools failed. There was a Wheat Board back in 1919 for one year. And so when the government disbanded the original Wheat Board, uh, farmers weren't happy. Uh, they, in their mind at least, the Wheat Board had to do with getting higher prices. When they first established the Wheat Board, one of the reasons they needed it or wanted it was that Canada was a major supplier to Britain during the war years. And this was a way of securing supply for that. But the first wheat board was established after the First World War. Governments of the day wanted to return to the open market and they tried to return to the open market. But farmers again lobbied very heavily to have that returned. And ultimately the wheat board did become mandatory in the 1930s. The government stepped in and formed the wheat board in order to handle the grain for the farmers and sell it on the world market. It was felt that because Canada was such a large supplier of the world markets, we could get better prices with a single desk seller, as it was described. That experiment and their experience made them want a wheat board. And of course, there was this underlying egalitarian notion that all farmers should be treated equally and they should get the same price for the same quality. And so they lobbied long and hard and eventually they got a wheat board in 1935. And so that was uh, part of the agrarian movement. It was an extension of the whole notion that we're in this together and we should help each other. After the war and as new crops came along, farmers began to uh, take a much broader interest in what they were doing in the whole process of not only production but also marketing. And uh, they discovered they could quite readily market their canola. And I think as the age of the farmers changed, the ones who had grown up in the 1930s and 40s were no longer around. The importance of the Wheat Board historically tended to diminish. And then over time and over the last, I would say probably 15, 20 years, uh, one could see the Wheat Board starting to lose some of its power for a variety of reasons. There wasn't the same public support for it. Farmers were better marketers. One might also say there were ideological issues. The Canadian Wheat Board disbanded the single desk marketing power on August 1st, 2012. Irrespective of the economics, the idea that the farmer cannot sell his own property <laughs> at whatever price he wants, I found it abhorrent. In my personal opinion, the Wheat Board was a, a perfect tool. It allowed me to um, market my grain without worrying about whether I was getting a better price than my neighbor. I had come to a mental conclusion that I would set, accept the average of the year, the pool. That's the, that was the principle behind the pool. I wouldn't get the high, I wouldn't get the low. I didn't have to worry if it was Thursday or Monday or if my neighbor went before me or I was ahead of my neighbor, who got there first or who got there last. We got the, the pool price. That was the whole term of, of pool meant, it meant average, right across the board. You, I didn't have to wake up in the morning and think, oh, where's the market today? In the early 20th century, grain elevators dotted the prairies every six to 10 miles or 10 to 15 kilometers apart, a distance that was a good day's journey for farmer and horse with a full load. Probably every 10 miles there was a grain elevator. Nowadays, you might go 50, 60 miles without seeing a grain handling facility. Branch line network strung like spider webs across the west. In the 70s and 80s, there was a great deal of branch line abandonment. By 1930, there were 5,733 grain elevators in Western Canada, and now only 346 grain elevators stand. Particularly in the grain handling business, where you have now 
but far fewer, a fraction of the number of elevators spread across the prairies. The farmers have to haul long distances anyway. And if one company gets control over too many grain elevators in one area, the farmer really, for all practical purposes, has no choice because he'd have to truck his grain hundreds of kilometers. And so much is becoming not capitalism, but corporatism. And I think that is where the danger lies. Over the past 150 years, the role of private grain companies has been important to the development of Western Canada. Winnipeg was the hub of all of that at that time. It was the gateway to Western Canada. It was a, a, a transportation centre, a distribution centre, and it was a headquarters of the agricultural business in Western Canada, particularly the grain trade. There was thousands of participants in the grain trade in Canada and hundreds of companies involved in the grain industry back then. We could probably count them on one or two hands today. We were started in 1909, uh, started by uh, a 50-year-old parish and a 30-year-old Heimbecker. So I'm the fourth generation parish. It was a bit more of a cowboy era then. The Heimbeckers were flour millers in Ontario around the turn of the century. They decided that they needed to take a much larger interest in, in procuring wheat for their flour business and they dispatched their son Norman, who was the oldest of ten children, out to Western Canada to learn more about the procurement of wheat. He ran into and made friends with uh, W.L. Parrish, who was already trading grain under the name of Parrish and Lindsay. Uh, they struck up a friendship that obviously morphed into something that was greater, uh, which became Parrish and Heimbecker. The founder of the business was actually by training a tailor, and as part of his business back in 1857, of uh, creating clothing for people in that community around Kingston, Ontario. It was not uncommon to take payment in the form of barter and one of the elements of barter that farmers in the Kingston area had of course was their production, their grain. So he became an owner of grain inadvertently in return for the clothing that he was making and he started to merchandise that grain to be able to create cash flow to be able to continue doing what he was doing. Well he found he was actually pretty good at merchandising grain and decided that might be a better pursuit to him than tailoring and that was the beginning, uh, the genesis of the company and it's carried through five generations to today. There's been four generations of Pattersons involved in the grain business in Western Canada. Our company has marketed grain before the wheat board, with the wheat board, and now again after the wheat board is gone. The company was formed by my grandfather, but actually my great-grandfather, H.S. Patterson, merchandised the first cargo of wheat out of the province of Manitoba. It's surprising how many multi-generational relationships exist between the Richardson family and a number of farm families in Western Canada where we were doing business built on service and trust over the years. The management of Parrish and Heimbecker uh, are actively involved um, out in the country with producers. Uh, we still think that matters and the feedback that we get is that they find it amazing that the owners of the businesses would actually take the time to come out to the individual country locations, meet with them, actually hear their concerns versus having them sort of filtered through the grain elevator and the merchants, etc. So we spend a lot of time to build that uh, communication link and foster the growth of the relationship. It's been said that if men were the pioneers, women were the settlers. They were the ones that created a home out of some very, very sparse resources that they had to work with when people first arrived here. And they were doing this all the time while they were caring for and producing children, which were a major source of labor on the farm. And the day I was born, the thrashing crew pulled in that morning to start thrashing. And mother not only had to look after me, <laughs> she had to feed the thrashing gang about a dozen men and one of the neighbors came over to help her look after feeding the thrashing crew and a week later she had a baby of her own. We had to make a living in the 30s and mother had to help with the milking at night and I did. We all learned because the men were busy with using horses to farm and so it was a whole different era. We've seen the farm women's jobs change over time, as all jobs on the farm have changed. But they're still the home builders, and they're still feeding the family. In many cases, 
Today, it's the farm wife that leaves the farm to work, and it's her salary that helps to support the family. I think it's electricity has, was the bonus that came to all rural communities in 1947, because we had no electricity on the farm, so it was a role to be homemaker and you had to make the bread and if you did the milking then you had to put it through this cream separator which was a horrible thing to wash. But mother would print up 15 pounds of butter at a time and send them to Deloraine and that was the money for groceries. As these farms became established, the attention very quickly turned towards community structures that provided some civilization and social support to what they were doing on the land. The women's movement becoming very powerful through organizations like the Women's Institute organization, and many of the women who were key players in that were people who came from pioneer stock. I met one lady when I was working with WI telling me that when she was farming there, she would go to a WI meeting six miles away and she would walk with a baby in her arms, another one over her shoulder, and the little ones walking for six miles to cross a stream and go to that meeting and then come home and do the chores. The Women's Institute organization, which fought, of all things, for public restrooms, because in that time, women would come to town with the family. The men could go to the pubs but women weren't allowed there. There was no place for women and children to be, and that was the foundation of the restrooms. For a lot of women, Women's Institute was their only uh, contact as a group together. An older lady said that one of their members came in and she was pregnant and she had nine children already at home. The group gathered around her and just cried because family planning wasn't legal at that time. Cases like that, you feel that you've been right inside a person's heart. Though farmers, for the most part, were exempt from military service, and that doesn't mean they didn't go, but I think that's where one found the women taking a much bigger role in the management of agriculture. And I think when the fellows came back after the war, the ladies had taken over a certain amount of doing some of these things. And uh, I think we find a lot of farms now that the role played by women, particularly women who graduate with degrees in agriculture, more than half of the students taking agriculture at the University of Manitoba are women. The first woman, Dorothea Clark, graduated in 1922. It wasn't until 13 years later that the second woman graduated. And looking at the statistics, up until the mid-60s, from the time the college started until the mid-60s, there had been only 21 women students graduate. In the mid-90s, two of the years there, there was actually 75% of the student body were women. Now, it's about 50-50. The University of Manitoba, from its earliest days, had a unique way of providing education to its citizens. The college at that time had a very close association with the Ministry of Agriculture and one of the things that it did starting in 1907 and it carried on till the mid-twenties was put out extension trains and these were actual trains that went out there would be two or three cars and they went out to various communities and there was one that was the dairy special and it would have the newest milking equipment the newest kind of technology that was available how you would feed your dairy cattle and this would be contained in these cars. They would attract the local farmers. They would come out and gather information or there would be a lecture given. There were a number of these different trains. They lasted into the 20s and they stopped at 150 different points in Manitoba and reached more than 35,000 people. So that was the degree of importance that was placed on this information that was being taken from the college out into the countryside. Cora Hind was a woman who came to Western Canada in the early 1800s. She had uh, come out here to work as a school teacher and wanted to become a newspaper reporter. She was originally turned down. It was considered newspapers were no place for, for women to be. But she ultimately became the agricultural editor of the Winnipeg Free Press. And she took that job and created a persona around herself because of her very intuitive ability to judge how much the crops were going to produce. Every year, she traveled across Western Canada and looked at the crops and wrote what she thought that crop was going to produce 
and she was remarkably accurate in her projections. And she was widely followed by anyone in the world that had an interest in what Western Canada was going to contribute to the world grain trade. She was also very active in the suffragette movement and very active in securing social supports for women. After fighting so hard to get a job working in the press, she was ultimately paid the best compliment she could have received at the time. Her colleagues reported that the best newspaper man in Western Canada was a woman, and that was E. Cora Hind. Funding for Built on Agriculture is provided in part by Manitoba Government, Growing Forward 2, a federal, provincial, territorial initiative, Government of Canada, Macdon Industries, Monsanto, Canada, the Bicentenary of the Red River Selkirk Settlement Committee, and the members of Prairie Public. To order a copy of the four-part series, Built on Agriculture, call 1-800-359-6900 or visit our online store at prairiepublic.org.